good morning. Welcome to this convocation, uh, the very beginning of our inaugural activities this week. And I am so grateful to see each of you and honored uh, that you are here. I am grateful for all the, the interruption to your schedules and all the sacrifices that so many are making to, to help uh, facilitate these inauguration activities. And you have blessed me and honored me. And, and you are, as expected, you represent this school so very well. I'm grateful to be a part of this community and uh, thankful you're here. Thankful for, um, and we will say things as we continue, but thankful for uh, Dr. Kitty Coffey and Dr. Clark Mizells who have chaired our steering committee for all things inauguration and they have just served this institution well and we've been blessed through their leadership and so I'm grateful for them. This morning, this is uh, an academic address and looking forward uh, to uh, our time together. Uh, we're going to be uh, led in our service in just a moment. Uh, Dr. David Crutchley will offer our invocation and, uh, and later in, in our service, our um, outstanding faculty award recipient, Bruce Coker, will uh, provide our benediction. I'd like to take just a, a moment. I want to, to extend uh, more of a personal introduction for our speaker this morning. David Dockery came to be president uh, at Union University uh, as at an, when I was serving on their administration. And he has, uh, as many of you who know him and, and perhaps have read about him, I mean, he has had an incredible uh, and uh, substantive and continues to make a substantive contribution to higher education. He served as the president at Union University. He left and became the president at Trinity International and currently serves as chancellor. Uh, you may have seen the uh, press releases this summer where he has been appointed professor of theology and the inaugural theologian in residence at the B.H. Carroll Center for Baptist Heritage at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Something that uh, you will hear more about in the coming days um, as Carson Newman is, is uh, participating in this. He's the founding president of the International Alliance for Christian Educators. It's a new organization that is launching uh, this in 2020 that is, is going to be make such an important contribution to higher education. He's a prolific author. He's a great historian. He is a sought-after speaker in so many venues and preacher. He cast a pretty long shadow over Christian higher education. And I'm grateful to call him friend and, and grateful for the opportunity to observe his leadership up close and learn from him. One of the things that's, and it's very pertinent to our time this morning, um, that um, when he came to uh, Union, there was something quite distinctive about his leadership, and it um, was his commitment to mission. I had really never in any other context been around a leader who, whether it was our senior leadership team gathering or whether he was standing in front of faculty, donors, or are in whatever context. I can tell you that, that uh, he always led on the foundation of mission. I learned what the power of a wholesale commitment to mission really means for an institution by watching 
and learning from this man's leadership. It, is, it was inspiring. I still remember in one of our very first um, strategic plans at Union, there was an introduction to the plan that he had written where he said that he would, uh, that he was so committed uh, to mission that he didn't want to succeed outside of the mission. It is, a, it is something that uh, I think this morning you will see the way he thinks, the way he frames his thoughts historically and biblically um, makes uh, it such a great honor for me to welcome him to Carson Newman. And would you extend uh, a warm uh, Carson Newman welcome to David Dockery and to his wife, Lenise, who are with us today. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to this day of November 7, 2019, not by accident. Your presence and provision undergird the story of this place. We reach back today through the musty corridors of time, and in March of 1849, we hear your whisper lighting the imagination of five men gathered under an oak tree. You were here. Two and a half years later, the dream was birthed and a denominational college established. Through the swirling winds of time, she changed her name from Mossy Creek Baptist Seminary to Mossy Creek College to the merger of Carson and Newman Colleges in 1889. You were here in the brokenness of the Civil War when the voices of teachers were silent and the campus filled with Union troops living and soldiering on her grounds. You were here through the periods of financial drought. You gave resources to continue her history. You were here through the chapters of each generation. You have carved out on the anvil of this place an opportunity for young men and women to come and study and prepare for the journeys of life. You are here. We give thanks this day for the thousands of students who have walked across the campus of our university, realizing dreams and embracing new destinies. We thank you for the gift of faculty who have lodged in this safe place and tutored hungry minds and thirsty hearts with building blocks for their lives and careers. We thank you for the ceaseless labor and perseverance of staff who have walked through the centuries hand in hand with faculty, who found their place of service and fidelity in assisting the university in her mission. We pause with gratitude as we reflect on the 22 presidents who have brought strength, wisdom, and vision to the institution across three centuries. We acknowledge your goodness this day in bringing our 23rd president and his wife, Dr. Charles Fowler and Sandra, to embrace a new chapter in the Carson Newman story. We pray that you will give to them a sense of joy in the task that beckons, wisdom in the times of decision, courage in the moments of fear, peace and confidence when the way seems hard. Our Heavenly Father, we reach out and covet your blessing on this institution as we lean into the future and the unknown. May we discover as we walk out in faith your grace, your mercy, your love, and your leading. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Thank you, Dr. Crutchley. I, uh, uh, maybe this will be the last time that I deviate from our order of service this, these two days, but I, I must stand and just uh, bring, call to your attention just some, uh, some honored guests we have with us today. I'm so grateful for so many of our trustees and others, but I would love if we could just, to, just extend a welcome home uh, welcome uh, to Dr. Jim and Patricia Netherton who are here with us today. Would you stand and let our community welcome our former president back home? Thank you. Thank you. We are so grateful you're here and blessed by your presence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fowler, for your very generous uh, introduction. What a privilege it is today for me to be here for this inauguration time on the Carson Newman campus. Congratulations, President and Mrs. Fowler. We are excited about you assuming this role as the 23rd president of Carson Newman University. I have some more things I want to say about your president tomorrow, more appropriate for that uh, particular inauguration hour, uh, or two hours, if you are uh, planning for that. Uh, but today we want to talk mostly about uh, what it means to be a distinctive Christian university at this place. But before doing so, I want to make a quick presentation to Dr. Fowler as an inauguration gift I know he is learning Carson Newman's history and investing himself not only in plans for the future, but learning the past, serving in the present, dreaming for the future. And one aspect of the past is captured in this book, which I recently found in a used bookstore. It is a treasure, one of the first histories of Tennessee Baptist uh, ever written. It was, uh, this is the first edition uh, published a hundred years ago in 1919. It's called Sketches of Tennessee's Pioneer Baptist, and it's written by a Carson Newman graduate of the 1870s, J.J. Burnett. So this is a way to introduce uh, Dr. Fowler even deeper to this wonderful heritage that is yours here on this campus, and I wanted to share this treasure uh, that I found in a wonderful used bookstore with my dear friend, Dr. Fowler, congratulating him on this special occasion. Thank you, Professor Brock, for the beautiful music, and Dr. Crutchley for your prayers. So good to see so many friends here today. It's a joy to be back on the Carson Newman campus. I've been here several occasions. I was reminding Dr. Netherton I was here for his inauguration. It doesn't seem that long ago to me, but time moves very quickly. I'm grateful to have known Dr. Maddox, Dr. Netherton, Dr. O'Brien, considering them friends and so many others who are here. So thank you for the privilege and opportunity to be a part of this day and tomorrow as well as we think together about these important matters. I want to uh, say to the board members and to the search committee, uh, congratulations on a job well done. I know that you're in for good days ahead. I cannot wait to see what God has in store uh, for this place uh, in years to come. Dr. Fowler asked me if I would give an academic address this morning. And it is that. It's a formal address. It's not a sermon. Uh, it will last about 40 minutes or so. Uh, very few jokes. Uh, in order to save time, we'll just skip all of those and uh, get right to the heart of the matter. What I want to try to do today is to suggest that education formed by Scripture, tradition, and the church, informed by the good, the true, 
and the beautiful points to a transformational and distinctive Christ-centered higher education. So that's what we're going to try to think about together over the next few minutes. You pray for me. Trust God's Spirit to lead us as we think about these things together. Christian higher education involves a distinctive way of thinking about teaching, learning, scholarship, subject matter, student life, administration, and governance that is grounded in the orthodox Christian faith. Our vision for Christian higher education is not just about an inward, subjective, and pious Christianity, as important as these things may be. We believe that the Christian faith needs fleshed out on a campus beyond devotional practices, beyond chapel services, and affects how we think, how we teach, how we learn, how we write, how we lead, how we govern, how we treat one another, how we discern what is true and good and beautiful. It is our hope on this day that an understanding of a full-orbed vision for Christian higher education will help us to prepare a generation of students at Carson Newman who can effectively serve both church and society, who can engage the culture, and who more importantly can treat others well. Our approach begins with an understanding of the self-revealing God who has created humans in His image. We believe that students created in the image of God are designed to discover truth, discern good, goodness, and appreciate beauty, and that the exploration of truth, goodness, and beauty is possible because the universe is created by the Trinitarian God, even in its current fallen and sinful state, is intelligible. These beliefs are held together by our understanding that the unity of knowledge is grounded in Jesus Christ in whom all things hold together, even the transcendentals or the universal ideals like the good, the true, and the beautiful which are so prominently featured on the Carson Newman seal and in your university hymn. The Christian faith then provides the lens to see the world, recognizing that faith seeks to understand every dimension of life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In doing so, we're building on those who have gone before us, seeking to learn from and retrieve from those who have shaped the Christian tradition. Building on the work of Clement of Alexandria, Augustine, Anselm, Thomas Aquinas, Erasmus, Luther, Melanchthon, Calvin, Charles Octavius Booth, John Broadus, C.S. Lewis, Dorothy Sayers, Luke Arambi, and many others, our efforts to advance authentic, Christ-centered higher education are greatly shaped by those who have gone before us. These influences and influencers have not only shaped us, but also reflect who we are. We recognize significant variety in our heritage, but we must not think that there is unlimited variety without boundaries or without a core. The richness of the Christian tradition can provide guidance for the complex challenges facing Christian higher education at this time. We believe not only that an appeal to the Christian tradition is timely, but also that it meets an important need because the secular culture in which we find ourselves is at best indifferent to the Christian faith and because the Christian world, at least in its more popular forms, tends to be confused about beliefs, heritage, and tradition associated with the Christian faith. At the heart of this calling is the need to prepare a generation of Christians to think carefully, wisely, and Christianly, to engage the academy and the culture, to serve society, to renew the connection with the church and its mission. To do so, both the breadth and the depth of the Christian tradition will need to be reclaimed, renewed, revitalized, and revived for the good of Christian higher education. Reconnecting with the great confessional tradition of the church will help us to avoid a shallow kind of fundamentalist reductionism on the one hand and a liberal revisionism on the other. 
Fundamentalist reductionism fails to understand that there are priorities or differences in the Christian faith. Fundamentalism often fails to distinguish between saying no to an inadequate confession of the deity of Christ and saying no to the wrong kind of social activity. On the other hand, liberal revisionism and its attempts to translate the Christian faith to connect with the changing culture has, since the days of Friedrich Schleimacher, often wound up revising the Christian faith instead of translating it. To borrow words from the Apostle Paul, we are then left with no gospel at all. So let us learn from the Apostle who was willing to address opponents coming from different directions, from one side like in Galatia and from another in Colossae, calling the churches back to the truth of the Christian faith. As we reflect further on these important matters, let us take a brief look at the key commitments found in the Creed of Nicaea, a 4th century confessional statement shared by all Christian traditions. The Creed of Nicaea was drafted to refute the claim that Jesus was the highest creation of God and thus different in essence from the Father. While articulating the importance of the unity of the Holy Trinity, the authors of this statement insisted that Christ was begotten from the Father before all time, declaring that Christ is of the same essence as the Father. When we contend today that Christian higher education then must be distinctively Christ-centered education, we are in effect confessing that Jesus Christ, who was eternally the second person of the Trinity, sharing all the divine attributes, became human. Thus to think of Christ-centeredness only in terms of personal piety or activism resulting from following some aspects of the teaching of Jesus while important, will be quite inadequate. A healthy future for Christian higher education must return to the past with the full affirmation that when we point to Jesus, we see the whole man Jesus and say that He is God. He is the beautiful way, the only truth, and the manifestation of a life of goodness. This is the great mystery of godliness, God fully manifested in the flesh. It is necessary that Christ should be both God and human. For only as a human could He be the Redeemer for humanity. And only as a sinless person could He fittingly die for others. And only as God could His life, ministry, and redeeming death have infinite value and satisfy the demands of God so as to deliver us from death. Any attempt then to envision a faithful Christian higher education for the days ahead that is not tightly tethered to the great confessional tradition in this confused and complex cultural context will most likely result in an educational model without a compass. But the only way to counter the assumptions that shape so many sectors of higher education today is to confess that the exalted Christ who spoke the world into being by His powerful Word is the providential sustainer of all of life and the source of all that is true, good, and beautiful. As we seek to bring the Christian faith to bear on the teaching and learning process in the work of distinctive Christ-centered education, our strategy must involve bringing those truths about Jesus Christ to bear on the great ideas of history as well as on the cultural and educational issues of our day. In doing so, our aim will be to adjust the cultural assumptions of our post-Christian context in light of God's eternal truth. We therefore want to call for the work of Christian higher education in the days ahead to take place through the lenses of the best of the Christian tradition that not only recognizes the Holy Trinity, but also heartily affirms the transcendent creating, sustaining, and self-disclosing Trinitarian God who has made humans in His image. Reflecting His nature and character with an ability to comprehend what is true, to judge what is good, and to recognize what is beautiful. 
A renewed vision for Christian higher education must not only connect with the best of the Christian tradition and our confessional heritage, but must also seek a purposeful connection with the churches. Carson Newman is not, is decidedly not a church. But Carson Newman remains connected with the churches. James Burchell, in his massive study, The Dying of the Light, surveyed dozens of institutions across various traditions, focusing on both 19th and 20th centuries examples. His important work has revealed how many institutions from various traditions have seen the light of the Christian faith die out on their campuses. Birchall may well have been wrong about some of the particulars in his research, and I think he was, but his big picture thesis holds consistently across the traditions and across the decades. The moment an institution begins to lose its connection with the churches is the day the light starts to disappear on the campus. Christ-centered institutions, while not churches, nevertheless are an extension of the churches, the very academic arm of the kingdom of God. High-quality teaching and scholarship will be recognized in the academy, and these educational efforts can be done without neglecting our connection with the church. Pope John Paul II, the brilliant leader of the Roman Catholic Church in the latter part of the 20th century, called for Catholic universities to reconnect with the heart of the church in his well-known statement, Ex Corde Ecclesia. While some may think today that John Paul II is an unusual model for us at this inauguration service, I believe that we can nevertheless learn from our Roman Catholic friends and seek to reconnect Protestant institutions like Carson Newman with the heart of faithful churches. Our dream today calls for Carson Newman University not only to deepen its Christ-centered commitments, but to renew its connection to the transcendentals and the Christian tradition and to strengthen its relationship with the churches. In doing so, we also want to be informed and formed by the great confessional tradition, including the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Confession, and the best of evangelical and Baptist confessional heritage. In 1678, when the General Baptists in Britain put together their highly influential Orthodox creed, they began the confession with a recognition of their dependence on this great confessional tradition. It is to that heritage that I want to appeal to you today. While none of these confessional statements are infallible, all are informative and helpful guides for us. Historical awareness will help us avoid confusing what is merely a momentary expression from that which has enduring importance for the sake of the churches, helping us to avoid the trap of immediatism. Let us emphasize that in essentials of the Christian faith, there is no place for compromise. Faith and truth are primary issues, and we stand Firm in those areas. Sometimes, however, Christians unwisely confuse primary issues and secondary issues. In secondary issues and tertiary issues, we need mostly love and grace as we learn to disagree agreeably. We want to learn to love one another in spite of our differences and to learn from those with whom we differ. We fail the church and the work of Christian higher education, however, when we fail to distinguish essential matters from non-essential ones. In essentials, we must stress that faith and truth are primary, and we may not appeal to love and grace as an excuse to deny any essential aspect of Christian teaching. When we center the work of Christian higher education on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will build on this ultimate foundation. I believe that a retrieval of the best of the great Christian tradition of the church will provide clarity and insight 
to, and to who we are as Christian educators and provide guidance for our future, enabling us to distinguish essentials from non-essentials and also helping us to express not only a faithful apostolicity, but a genuine Catholicity in our lives and in our work. The challenge for us is to preserve and to pass on the Christian tradition while encouraging honest intellectual inquiry. We need to encourage intellectual curiosity and find ways to pass on the Christian tradition while promoting serious intellectual engagement in the areas of teaching, research, and scholarship. There is no place for anti-intellectualism on the Carson Newman campus or any other Christian campus. Christian higher education is called to be academically rigorous, grounded in the confessional tradition, seeking to understand the great ideas of history and engaging with today's pressing issues. Christian higher education on this campus has been called to reflect on and to think about and to advance these commitments, to engage the challenging issues that will face us as we move into the middle of the 21st century. Therefore, we recognize the place for academic freedom within a confessional context. We recognize that exploration across the disciplines is to be encouraged. But some things may not be advocated within confessional commitments that bind us together as an educational community. We want to encourage genuine exploration and serious research while recognizing that free inquiry untethered from scripture, tradition, and the church often results in the unbelieving skepticism that characterizes so much of higher education today. The directionalist state that can be seen as we look across much of higher education is often found among many former church-related institutions that have become disconnected from the churches and from their heritage. Therefore, we need a renewed vision for Christ-centered higher education that will help us develop unifying principles for Christian thinking founded on the tenet that all truth, goodness, and beauty find their source in God, our Creator and Redeemer. As we do so, we will likely struggle with many issues because there are numerous matters that remain ambiguous Matters for which we still see through a glass darkly. Some questions will have to remain unanswered as we continue to struggle and wrestle together. Yet we envision a distinctive approach to higher education at Carson Newman distinctively different from the large majority of higher education institutions in the United States. We must not be naive to the challenges that will be encountered along the way. Unfortunately, some in the churches will be satisfied with a minimal commitment to warm-hearted piety that encourages campus Bible studies, kind relationships, and occasional mission trips. Certainly, we want to encourage and applaud such things, but not as an encompassing vision for Christian higher education. Frankly, most of these things can be carried out on public university campuses through and among parachurch organizations. We certainly want to see these things take place, but more importantly, we want to see an approach to education at Carson Newman that is primarily concerned with Christian thinking and thinking Christianly. Learning to think carefully, creatively, and critically seeking to engage the academy and the culture while serving both church and society. And as we do so, we need, not be a, we need to be aware that some in the academy, others in the culture, and still others within the church, sadly for different reasons, will question the very legitimacy of this project. 
we thus dream of a Christian college campus like Carson Newman that is faithful to the Lordship of Christ, that exemplifies the great commandment, that seeks justice, mercy, and love, that demonstrates responsible freedom, that prioritizes worship and service as central to all pursuits in life. These institutions must seek to build grace-filled communities that emphasize love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control as virtues that are needed to create a caring Christian context where undergraduate and graduate education grounded in the conviction that all truth, goodness, and beauty have their source in God can be offered. In doing so, we recognize that truth, goodness, and beauty have been considered ontologically one. Meaning that where one is found, the others can also be seen, at least in part, in ways that are reflected so well in the words of Harley Fight in tomorrow's program. The next piece of this vision for distinctive Christian education calls for a focus on students. We must constantly remind ourselves that what we do on this campus, we do for the sake of students. We want to encourage student consideration, concentration in at least one field of learning, which will include the ability to express and articulate their own thoughts clearly while learning to appreciate, respect, understand, and evaluate the thoughts of others, resulting in the lifelong habit of learning that will prepare students for careers as well as for graduate and professional studies. The goal is to prepare students for living the Christian life in contemporary society, enabling them to be faithful kingdom citizens in our 21st century world. Student life teams must seek to guide students in the development of priorities, practices, and habits that will contribute to their overall well-being and effectiveness intellectually, emotionally, physically, socially, and spiritually. Faculty have as their aim to stimulate students to think about issues of truth, values, and worldview, along with questions of how subject matter bears on people's lives so that they are equipped for a God-called vocation and service in both society as well as in the churches. Simultaneously, in our rapidly changing world, we'll need to continue exploring new educational delivery systems, given the economic challenges and the developing understandings of technology and the times in which we live. But that's a conversation for another day. In all of these things, we need to recognize that a commitment to rigorous and quality academics is best demonstrated by a God-called faculty. Research should be encouraged in all fields. Classroom teaching must be prioritized and emphasized. Faculty in all disciplines, including librarians and key student life staff, should be encouraged to explore how the Christian faith bears on all disciplines across the campus. This means that Christian higher education institutions like Carson Newman cannot be content to display their Christian commitments merely with chapel services and required Bible classes. We desire to see students move toward a mature reflection of what the Christian faith means for every field of study. In doing so, we can help develop a grace-filled, convictional community of learning. Because we can think, relate and communicate in understandable ways since we're all created in the image of God we can creatively teach learn explore and carry on research we want to maintain that there is a complementary even a necessary place for both teaching and scholarship a place like Carson Newman in common with other institutions of higher learning must surely subordinate all other endeavors to the improvement of the mind in pursuit of truth. Yet a focus on the mind and the mastery of content 
though primary, will not be enough. We believe that character and faith development, in addition to guidance and professional competencies, are similarly important. Furthermore, we maintain that the pursuit of truth and appreciation of beauty and goodness are best undertaken within a community of learning that includes colleagues of the present and voices from the past, representing the communion of saints, which also attends to the moral, spiritual, physical, and social development of its students, following the pattern of Jesus, who himself increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and humankind. One of the things for which we dream as we envision faithful Christian academic communities involves the promoting of genuine Christian community and a commitment to Christian unity on campus. We appeal for a oneness that is founded on the person and work of Jesus Christ and the common salvation that we all share in Him. One of the ways that we authenticate the message of the gospel and our shared and collaborative work in Christian higher education is the way that Christians love each other and live and serve together in harmony. It is this witness that our Lord wants and expects from us in the world so that the world may believe that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. A theme on which I hope to expand tomorrow morning. As we envision a blessed future for the shared work of Christian education on this campus, we are in no way naive to the multifaceted challenges and multi-level changes all around us. Economic, technological, denominational, educational, cultural, and on and on. The challenges facing Christian colleges and universities today cannot be neutralized simply by adding newer facilities, better campus ministry opportunities, improved student life programs. As important as these things may be, and as wonderful as they are here at Carson Newman, our 21st century context must once again recognize the importance of serious Christian thinking as necessary and appropriate for the well-being of Christian academic communities. We offer the Christian intellectual tradition to the 21st century Christ followers as a guide for that which is good, true, and beautiful to that which is imaginatively compelling, emotionally engaging, aesthetically enhancing, and personally liberating. We believe and contend that the Christian faith informed by scriptural interpretation, theology, philosophy, and history has bearing on every subject matter and every academic discipline. While at times the Christian's research in any field might follow similar paths and methods as the secularist, doxology, or the praise of the triune God at both the beginning and the ending of one's teaching and research marks the works of believers from that of the secularist. As George Marsden has observed, we recognize that some will consider this proposal outrageous. The pursuit of the greater glory of God remains rooted in a Christian worldview in which God can be encountered in the search for truth in every discipline. The application of the great tradition will encourage members of the Carson Newman community to see their teaching, research, study, student formation, administrative service, board guidance within the framework of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In these contexts, faithful Christian scholars will see their teaching and their scholarship as contributing to the unity of knowledge which provides the Christian frame of reference for understanding what is true and good and beautiful. Faculty, staff, and students will work together to enhance a love for learning that encourages a life of worship and service. 
The great tradition of Christian thinking helps us all better see the relationship between the Christian faith and the role of reason while encouraging Christ's followers to see the good, to engage the true, and to appreciate the beautiful with a view towards strengthening the church and extending the kingdom of God. We're calling for a vision of Christian higher education that is unapologetically Christian and rigorously academic. It involves developing resources for serious Christian thinking and scholarship in all disciplines, not just theology, biblical studies, and philosophy. We believe the time is right to reconsider afresh this vision, not just because of the timing of a new administration on this campus, but because of the challenges and disorder across the academic spectrum. The reality of the fallen world in which we live is magnified for us in day-to-day life through broken families, sexual confusion, conflicts between the nations, and the racial and ethnic prejudice we observe all around us. In these ethical areas, particularly the need for racial reconciliation, we continue to appeal to Carson Newman graduate T.B. Masden as the prophetic guide in these areas. The vision helps us understand that there is a place for beautiful music and the arts because God is a God of creation and beauty. We recognize that the social sciences can make observations to strengthen society, families, and religious structures by recognizing the presence of the image of God in all women and men as well as the ideal for goodness in society. Those who study economics can help address problems facing communities and society at large as well as expand our awareness of how wealth is produced and good stewardship calls for it to be used. Political philosophy scholars can strategize about ways to address issues of government, public policy, war, justice, and peace. Ethical challenges in business, education, and health care can be illuminated by reflection both on the transcendentals as well as the great Christian tradition. Therefore, exploring every discipline from a confessional perspective which affirms that we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, will both shape and sharpen our focus. Each discipline is also informed by the reality that we live in a fallen world, yet with the hope of redemption and reconciliation found in Jesus Christ. The more we emphasize the pattern of Christian truth, the more important its role will become for teaching, learning, research, scholarship, and all activity across this campus. In that regard, as modeled for years by Ken Sparks, we recognize that these themes have application for extracurricular activities on this campus as well. This proposal is rooted in the conviction that God, the source of all that is true, good, and beautiful, has revealed Himself fully in Jesus Christ. And it is our belief in the union of the divine and human in Jesus Christ that the unity of that which is good, true, and beautiful will ultimately be seen. What is needed is a renewed understanding and appreciation of both the depth and the breadth of the Christian tradition with its commitment to the church's historic confession of the Trinitarian God and a recognition of the world and all subject matter as fully understandable only in relationship to this Trinitarian God. While our approach to higher education values and prioritizes the life of the mind, it is also to be understood as a holistic call for the engagement of head, heart, and hands, including that important service tradition that has been so strong at Carson Newman through the years, especially the reach into Appalachia. 
It is our hope that the ideals and commitments called for in this inaugural convocation address will not, will not be culturally confined. For we believe that these are things that cannot be easily expunged without great peril to ourselves and to this institution's future, both in the present and in the days to come. In the midst of the confused cultural and cultural ethos of our day, we need commitments that are firm but loving, clear but gracious, encouraging the people of God to be ready to respond to the numerous issues and challenges that will come our way without getting drawn into every intramural squabble in the church or in the culture. Let us pray that we can learn to relate to one another in love and humility, bringing new life to our shared efforts in Christ-centered higher education. We pray not only for renewed confessional convictions, but for a genuine orthopraxy that can be seen before a watching world. A world, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, that seemingly stands on the verge of giving up on the Christian faith. We trust that the collaborative efforts to advance distinctive Christian higher education on the Carson Newman campus in the days to come will bring forth fruit, will strengthen the churches and extend the kingdom of God. Let us ask God to renew our shared commitment to academic excellence on this campus in our teaching, our learning, our research, our scholarship, our service, as well as in our discipleship and churchmanship. I want to encourage you as you begin this new chapter in the life of the Carson Newman community, not only to support and encourage your new president, but to teach, learn, serve faithfully and joyfully, doing so together as you seek to advance the work of distinctive Christian higher education at Carson Newman University in the days to come for the glory of our great God. May the Lord be with Carson Newman's 23rd president. And may the Lord's blessings be with all of you, each and every one. Thank you very much. As I listened to Dr. Dockery's address, uh, I remembered a time that he and I walked into a Lutheran church who had sadly recently ceased to, to, um, uh, to be. And um, we walked into the worship center and he picked up a hymnal in this Lutheran church to look for the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I will remember what happened when the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, was not in the Lutheran hymnal. And he looked at me and said, this is what happens when a church forgets the faith of their fathers. And and today, what Dr. Dockery has done is reminded us of the importance of the Christian intellectual tradition. And we are a part of the expression of the Christian intellectual tradition today. And it is a great honor uh, for us. And I just say thank you. Your comments have been fitting and powerful, and, uh, and I look forward to trying to find faithful expression of your charge to us in our work here at Carson Newman.
Thank you all for being here um, this uh, later this afternoon at 5:30. We'll be gathering uh, in the uh, Student Activity Center for a time of of a picnic and then for a worship service at 6:30 in Holt Gymnasium. I hope you'll all join us. I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Coker to the podium to word our benediction today. God bless you and thank you for being here. Good morning. Before I offer our benediction, um, I would like to invite you to two special exhibits that uh, we have at the library. The first is a large display of well wishes uh, that have come in from colleges, universities, seminaries, and individuals uh, in honor of Dr. Fowler's inauguration. Um, and these certificates and letters have come in from all over the country. It's a very impressive display. Um, the second exhibit is an ongoing one in the Lynn and Lindsay Denton Gallery in the library, and it features the heritage edition of the St. John's Bible, um, as well as both the William Hild and William VL uh, collections of, of biblical artifacts. Um, a very interesting display. So as you explore uh, the campus over the next couple of days, uh, we hope you'll drop by the, the library and, and check out these exhibits. And now if you would please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and the joy of being in a place where we can so openly worship you and praise you. A place where we can so freely talk about you and earnestly seek your will for our lives. A place where we can safely wrestle with difficult questions as we seek your truth and grow in our faith. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to work together to learn together, and to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. You are the foundation on which we have built and continue to build this community of learning, and we praise you for your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for sending us leaders who have guided Carson Newman throughout her history, and we thank you for Dr. and Mrs. Fowler whom you have called to lead us into the future. Bless them and strengthen them to meet the challenges ahead. Father, as we leave this place, help us to be mindful always of your gifts of grace and your infinite love. And help us to grow in our faith each day so that we may more perfectly reflect your love and shine your light into a world so desperate for the good news of Jesus. God of beauty, truth, and goodness, be with us now and always. We love you. Amen.